I thought I was a good teacher, but after that review, apparently I'm not. I've got lots to do to get better. So my head is my reviewer. And imagine my delight when I found out today that he's already decided on two of our targets for this year. I wonder if he'll work on them for me as well. I was observed last term, and I had a nightmare lesson. The kids didn't understand the work, the behaviour was worse than normal, and I felt like running through the door and heading for the hills. I came out the review, and I just felt so demotivated. Surely that can't be right. Problems with performance management have been acknowledged. But a school in East London has tackled many of these criticisms head on. Can I put the ball in properly, please? The first step for them was understanding why it wasn't working. Performance management at Brampton Manor really had to be changed because it had absolutely no impact on learning. It had become a task that reviewers had to do. They set some objectives, they put it away in a file and came back to it a year later. In the past, what's happened, even at Brampton, I don't, it was just another chore, another, something else that everyone had to do and more papers to fill in. Sometimes it was this huge thing that people used to sit down and they'd plan to do something and it was just too big and too daunting. Beforehand there was lots of talk about kind of, you know, professional development, but no targets, no meetings, nothing to tell us how to do it. The school committed to change a year ahead of September 2007's new performance management regulations. They've seen remarkable results. There's been a huge shift in professional development for everyone at Brampton Manor this year. It's opened our eyes up a bit to, so we can look around the staff room and realise there are actually hundreds of other teachers here and we've all got different skills. The best thing about it is that someone's there supporting you throughout the whole thing and they're going to actually monitor, help you monitor it, whether you meet your targets or not. You've got enough time to set yourself a target that you actually want to work on and it's something that you can build into your practice. It's just brilliant now. You really get the support and help from, from the staff. Brampton Manor has faced many challenges along the way. Performance management has a lot of negative connotations, is not looked upon that favourably by many members of staff. They've learnt lessons about how to best implement a new approach. Do you enjoy doing this? We do, once we get started, we do actually. We never like the preparation. You're a very effective teacher. I know you would have met your targets. Whatever they were, I know you would have acted on them. We like role plays. We just feel, it's, it, you can tell them what a good P, um, PDR meeting should look like, but that doesn't have much impact. For, for us, I think the biggest change came when we um, introduced the kind of the questioning that we would use when you are target setting. So I thought I wanted to make it a lot more explicit to them to, so they knew what the level five criteria was. I don't want any of you in here to be getting a level four, but I want to point out to you the difference between a level four and a level five. I do think that the pupils will have noticed a difference. I think it's helped me to, to achieve high iron and get the level that I really wanted to get. They've also piloted new strategies that can be successfully replicated elsewhere. We've been in the network for about a year now, but we've decided to do things slightly differently and introduce a coaching element so that we get more out of it. Hi, Good to you? see you. Yeah. I absolutely think the success of Brampton Manor here can be replicated um, because there is a very simple shift in mindset that can be brought about. Three people have been key to the success of changes made at the school. Gurgit Shergill, an advanced skills teacher. And the thing really worked for Brampton was the fact that we are a training school and we're supposed to be a lead school in the borough in terms of the training that we provide for our staff as well as the training we provide for, for other institutions. Um, so that really kind of gave us that front footing as well to think, right, we are, we are going to do this. Nicola Williams, Deputy Head and CPD Leader. Everybody in our school is here because they want to have impact on learning. That's what really motivates teachers. It isn't money, it isn't being judged on, on targets that they perceive as being imposed on them. It's about having impact on learning. Vivian Porritt, Head of CPD at the London Centre for Leadership in Learning at the Institute of Education. My work really involves supporting schools who want to try a more innovative approach to performance management, who want to believe there must be a better way to spend all the hours that a school puts into performance management in a way that motivates staff and really makes a difference for the learning of the children in the classroom. 
We started to review um, performance management structure back in June 2006 and we'd had the draft deadlines by then and seen some presentations on what was coming up. Um, following Vivi, seeing Vivian Porritt talk about performance management, I came back into the school and we decided now was the time to relaunch it. When we found out the draft regulations were going to be put back for a year, we decided it was even a better opportunity then to go for changing the system, trying it for a pilot year and seeing how it worked. First of all, we wanted to rename it. Performance management has a lot of negative connotations, is not looked upon that favourably by many members of staff. It has that idea of being judged and being told off potentially if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. So we relaunched it as professional development reviews and we wanted to make it really clear that people didn't have, we knew people didn't have hours to waste. I had a performance management review yesterday. He mentioned some targets I had been set. First, I had heard about them. At the school, it was accepted that there had been problems with the performance management reviews, and specifically with the objectives that were chosen. So at the end of this, how will the difference in your practice be shown? Sometimes targets were being set which weren't even necessarily really relevant or realistic. It was targets and if they're not realistic targets then they mean nothing to that individual. The objectives tended to be um, the data objective on pupil progress would be plucked out of the air often unless you had someone who was really, really thorough at looking at the data. People didn't see that that was connected to improving learning in their classroom. They just saw it as something they were going to be tested against. When I talk with teachers, what I often hear about the objectives that seem to be quite, it seems to be quite a common feeling across schools is that they're often set up as boxes to be ticked or tasks to be achieved or, or at its worst, hoops to be jumped through. And that the tasks are often very management focused, very managerial, very much dealing with jobs that teachers have to do. For, for us, I think the biggest change came when we um, introduced the kind of the questioning that we would use when you are target setting and how it all started from thinking about the outcome, what do you want to achieve? Um, and then to reflect back on well, how are things at the moment, what is your baseline? Um, and using that method and then thinking about, what, I mean, one of the key questions in the review is how are you going to monitor the progress that is being made and then how are you going to evaluate it? What do you want to develop about your way of working to achieve this student outcome? So what, what's going to be different about the way that you teach to it? Hopefully um, I'm going to experiment a bit more in my class, classrooms with the seating plans, get students to work with different people, okay. which will hopefully enhance their skills of not working only with friends or with people they know. So the staff were actually thinking about the evaluation process rather than just setting a random target and you don't know how you're going to measure it. So by taking that process of questioning and that thought process, you know, you were answering all the questions and you knew that the target that you finally set will be a manageable one because you've just worked out that process. Um, I think what makes a difference with the objectives is if the member of staff, the person being reviewed in that sense, can come to a decision themselves about what they want to achieve in their own practice this year that will really make a shift, will really push on the learning of the children in their classroom. What one particular focus can I have this year that will stretch me as a practitioner will enable my children to achieve their full learning potential and really demonstrate the improvement needed within the school. If you can look for one thing that will achieve all of those three objectives, that to me would make a really powerful objective for the year. I'm the reviewer and I feel like I'm the one that needs help. I don't know all the CPD options that are out there. The reviewers are the people that can make or break a, a, a professional development review because if they're not really that committed to it, if they don't give it the full hour, if they're not prepared or they've rushed or they haven't really thought about that colleague, then you're going to feel a bit stupid for going along and valuing it. As a reviewer, the previous way was rather arbitrary um, and you could leave a review meeting feel that you hadn't really um, achieved anything or hadn't really come up with anything concrete. In a teacher's week there is so much to do and I think some teachers see it as something extra 
they have to do on top of their weekly duties anyway. So I think teachers probably feel sometimes it's like, oh God, this is something extra. You have to get the reviewers really on side and really believing that this is the way that they can impact on improving their colleagues. To get the message across, we first of all, we disaggregate an inset day to make sure people have got time to do their professional development reviews. We launched it with an hour and a half staff inset with the reviewers all together and the reviewees all together. We talked about what it had been like before, what they would want from a proper professional development review. And we got them to sort of begin to think about what the process would mean, to take ownership of it, and to think about where they were in terms of learning in their classroom and what they really wanted to improve. Um, we're about to deliver an inset on professional development review. It's really important that we really sell the ethos today and that we get everybody focused on how it's uh, CPD is central to school improvement. Do you enjoy doing these? <laughs> so bit... we do, once we get started, we do actually. We never like the preparation. And one or two, well, either one of us either gets a little bit funny and the other one has to calm that one down. But once we get going, we love it. Well, I've been Carry calming on. her down today. No, I've been coming you down today. <laughs> Everyone's a reviewee. Some of you are reviewers. You all have a responsibility. This isn't a meeting you can just stroll up to. And if it's a meeting that I, neither of you have planned, it won't be successful. Whatever you're identifying as your main learning outcome should be part of what the school's working on, what your learning area are working on, and therefore what you're going to be working on this year anyway. Uh, right, going on to the other review stage bits. Areas of affirmation. You do a great job. You, you know, I tell you that. Um, I guess so. Yeah. Gadget, you, you're selling yourself short. You're a very effective teacher. I know you would have met your targets. Whatever they were, I know you would have acted on them. <laughs> we like role plays. <laughs> we just feel... It's, it, you can tell them what a good people... Um, PDR meeting should look like, but that doesn't have much impact. I mean, it's the same as teaching a class. You don't learn by just talking, you learn by looking and then by doing. So, and we hope that your professional development review meeting will look more like this. Hi, Gurdjit. OK, shall we start with the review stage of your last year's objectives? So they're having a chance to look at what's happened, do their own reflection, and then they'll be doing their meetings in the next four weeks. When I first realised it was actually integral to the whole school and the pupils and my learning, was after the meeting when I was like, oh, that's actually really useful to me. And it's not just about my targets and I've done them and they're in a box. I can follow those targets through to the lesson and the pupils are starting getting things from that, which is great. To me, it's just something extra I have to do. I can't see the point. It's not like we're not busy enough already. We're really aware that performance management, when it's done properly, is very time consuming. So we actually disaggregate an inset day every year so that we give people those six hours. We've taken one for training. They then have five hours in which to do the reflection time and their interview. They also came up with two unique solutions to combat tight schedules and allow teachers time for reflection. The Reflective Practitioner Journal is a journal which staff use. Um, it's broken down into key areas, whether it is teaching and learning, um, assessment, data and things like that. And there's some key questions that are within this journal that gets the staff to think about their own practice and to think about their successes or areas of development. They don't always have time to necessarily think, how did my lesson go? is that seating plan appropriate for that class. So the RPJ, the Reflective Practitioner Journal, is really there. It's within their classroom planner, so it is there as a combined document where they can actually reflect on their practice.
It took people a while to get used to just the term, you know, reflective practitioner journal, the RPJ. At first people couldn't remember what it was or why we had it and some people liked it immediately because it fitted into their way of working. For some people it's, it's quite alien for them, it's not really the way they would work. But increasingly it's become part of, of just school practice, it's something people accept is an essential part of, of their role as a teacher. The Reflective Practitioner Journal is actually very useful when we have a meeting. It's not an additional booklet that you have to remember to carry with you. So it's easy to refer to when you're talking about specific things, whether it's seating plan or marking policies. The school is also piloting a new web resource. The CPD directory was central to really moving things forward here with us at Brampton, especially with our middle leaders because what they have found in the past is it was a bit of a paper chase. I'm filling in this piece of paper, this lesson observation, and what happens to it? It gets filed away, collects a bit of dust. So what we thought is we need to have a central pool where all this data can be, can be kept and accessed when necessary. So the idea of the CPD directory was born. So if my target is of questioning, I can go to the CPD directory and it will tell me what departments or what individuals are good at questioning. And that's a resource as well that we we could just use and we didn't have that before. You get internal links from the CPD directory and external links to, um, you might type in a keyword, for example, questioning uh, might be something that you want to focus on. So you'll have some internal links of some resources or insets that might have been delivered by staff. And then you'll also have some key teachers who are, who are, uh, who are, who are down as being good teachers when in terms of their questioning. So you can go and observe their good practice. Um, you also have it external links to websites, whether it's te you might have something linked to Teachers TV. Sometimes you get stuck in your classroom and you're so focused on what you're doing and if something's going wrong or if something's going right, you're stuck there and you're not sharing it. And it's made us realise there's loads of people we can share stuff with and there's loads of people that we can learn from. Teachers are all facing very similar issues in classrooms with similar children all the time. And anything that we can do that will help people learn from each other and with each other has got to save time in a school, and that's our most precious resource. The directory can be viewed as the school's personal pick and mix of CPD options. plenty on offer and with the information so readily available to reviewers there's a much better chance that everyone will end up with the right mix of options. A tailor-made CPD action plan that perfectly fits their needs. If you're really looking at the one aspect of their own practice a member of staff wants to push forward and stretch and you're allying that to the needs of those particular children that that teacher works with, you're getting a very in-depth needs analysis for that member of staff and you're getting a very personalised objective and focus. Therefore you need a very personalised response for the professional development opportunities to enable that teacher to grow and develop further. At Brampton Manor, priority has been given to performance management and the CPD leader is seen as a linchpin of the school. For any approach in a school to be consistent and for any approach in a school to have clarity of outcome, I think there needs to be one person leading um, that approach and that strategy. And I think they've got to apply leadership skills. As a CPD leader, you have to really work very hard to get the balance right between ensuring that school priorities are being met and team priorities are being met, while making sure that you're listening to what staff are saying to you about their own training needs. They've got to set out a clear picture We've got to set out a vision of what they want to achieve and what's possible to achieve. And they've got to communicate that really strongly with people. Because you're the person who's really at the sort of heart of that, being able to pull all of these different learning outcomes together, training needs together, so you can ensure that the school is a place which is responsive to adults as well as to students. Objectives, targets, goals. It just adds up to more work for me. I don't sure what me, all the students get out of it. So then, you all say you want to get level 6s and level 7s, but taking it back to a level 5, what do we need to do? 
Yep. The rate of change at the school has been rapid. Excellent, explain the links. Now you guys have done really, really well because I haven't even given you any success criteria. I haven't told you what your essay needs to be. With noticeable improvements for both teachers and pupils. So for my last review, I chose to focus on students not really being aware of their levels because I found that in my geography lessons I would be talking about levels, right, OK, we need to get you to a level 5, a level 4, a level 6. But the students weren't really aware of, of what a level 5 entailed and what they had to do to reach that level. So I thought I wanted to make it a lot more explicit to them to, so they knew what the level 5 criteria was, so they knew what they were aiming for, so that if they knew it, then therefore they'd be able to progress and hit that target. OK, then. So we're going to start off looking at level four. We don't, I don't want any of you in here to be getting a level four, but I want to point out to you the difference between a level four and a level five. For level four, you're just going to describe the types of crime, whereas level five, you're going to describe the, type, the crime in some detail, OK? So, Tanisha, could you do a level four answer for me? Could you describe the different types of crime? Some crimes include rape, murder, burglary and robbery. Excellent. You've just listed them. You haven't gone into detail on them. I do think that the pupils will have noticed a difference because before um, I didn't really mention levels except for when it came to assessment time, whereas now I've built it into my practice. So we might be having a discussion in the class and I say, that's really well done, that's a level five answer now. So it's not just something that appears at the time of assessment, it's constant throughout my practice. I think it's very important because I know my target then and uh, how many points I need to do in each, uh, how many points I need to write in my essay. I think it's helped me to, to achieve higher and, and get the level that I really wanted to get. Every assessment we do, we'll get the levels and I'll read it and I'll target the level I want to get and then I'll write for that and I'll usually get that level. I just get the feeling that no one's really listening to me. The team was keen to be responsive to staff opinions on the changes taking place. As, as middle leaders, we were away sharing good The school yeah. wanted to find out what the staff thought about the new approach and how it was working for them. Um, and they really didn't want to only hear what the staff thought they should tell them. So they asked me as, an, as somebody independent and external, but who also understood the approach that the school was trying to adopt. And I think that using an independent person in that way was a, a very valuable factor. It's almost like there's an obligation. They feel they want to give something back because you've taken the time out to, to you know, give them a proper review. Then they feel obliged to you know, share amongst colleagues, this is my good practice, this is what I found out. We've really tried to listen to what people have said when they've evaluated aspects of our practice. Um, when Vivian came in, one comment we did get about the PDRs, was they, they were too much just about students learning and not enough about their own career progression, how they were going to be moving forward. So we made sure that this year when the review process was in, it was absolutely clear that, that review process was about where you were as an individual, how you'd moved on with your learning outcome, where you were going with your career, whether you were coming up for Charter London Teacher or Threshold, that, that we tried to swing that pendulum back more towards the middle. It's great talking about sharing good practice, but how about giving us the time to do it? Collaboration, sharing of best practice and networking have been high priority for the school. I'm off to Seven Kings High School for a network meeting. We've been in the network for about a year now, but we've decided to do things slightly differently and introduce a coaching element so that we get more out of it. The idea is that by coaching each other, we'll be able to share good practice more effectively, but also help the schools move on. Because sometimes with networks, you're in danger of, of just sitting in a meeting room and sharing good practice, and then you don't really take anything back because you don't really have time to do anything with it. So this way, we're going to help each other make the time and sort of provide um, that support for each other as fellow professionals. Hiya, Tracy. Hi, Good to you? see you. Yeah, I'm good. all right, thanks. Good. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. Brilliant. That's lovely. Okay. Let's go around. Yeah, let's go. If we could shift it to make that responsibility a bit more theirs. It, you know, if people go on a course, they come back, they feedback, they do something. But just that, that general learning that people get yeah. involved. But do they take ownership of it? Yeah. How much they take mm. back? Do they think about their own next steps? Or yeah. 
is it an enthusiasm but then maybe gets a bit overwhelmed with because they're enthusiastic about that that and that because that's something we've had previously at our school i think it's very important that the powerful learning happening during a performance management process that is innovative and that is creative and vibrant is actually shared both within the team and across the school and then across schools and across local authorities the improvement in brampton manor's performance management program has been felt across the school and acknowledged externally. The learning of the adults and the learning of the children in the classroom and that synergy between those two and the clarity with which the whole school is working towards that aim seems to have brought about really quite a remarkable change in a very quick period of time and without needing a great deal of resources but more a, a change in a mindset about the way they were going to approach performance management. You get I think now I see performance management as one of the most important things a school does. I absolutely think the success of Brampton Mama here can be replicated. It should be an inspirational and invigorating aspect of, of a school's life. And if you can't say as a CPD leader, I know it has impact on learning, I know it makes a difference, then you really have to question why all of these hours and hours of time are going into it. It does take, I think, a lot of reflection and a lot of dialogue amongst team leaders, performance management reviewers, so that people are all working towards the same aim. So level four, describe briefly different ways. It is a really exciting time for CPD and if you can really take your performance management and make it something that is meaningful and that does really reflect on learning, then you can have a massive impact on your school's performance.